Then what happened? Then they grabbed me, put me in the car, and they had their machine guns at the back of my neck. For about and I was in a couple of down to like a house. They dragged me uh, out. And they uh, basically uh, just emptied my pockets. Folder. They took everything and that's how I had. First back three in weeks the car, of captivity started in this house. Jonathan, first of all, congratulations on this uh, really amazing body of work, and uh, it's really great to sit down, have an opportunity to talk to you, a little more intimate conversation about uh, why you do what you do and your experiences in places like Syria and the Middle East. Um, you know, one thing, one, one thing for me is, I, I, if I had a choice of when to be a photographer, when, when I would want to be a working photojournalist as opposed to now, I think for me it would have been in the 60s, civil rights, Vietnam. Um, and it just, it was film, uh, I, you know, what, what, what about you? I thought about this multiple times and I remember seeing a lot of war pictures from the American Civil War and these guys following armies on campaign mm -hmm. month at a time and going through everything mm -hmm. these guys were going through and seeing these pictures of battlefields um, at a time where it's never been done before. Mm -hmm. So that period was always very interesting or maybe the war in Crimea also, they had guys right. out there yeah. covering it. Yeah in the late um, 19th century, and um, I would have to say World War II. Mostly on the German side, because really? uh, it's, it's not as well known, it's not right. as covered, mm -hmm. and I've met a bunch of these guys who fought on the German side uh, during World War II, and it was always more interesting to me to have an understanding of the losing side. And this is Jonathan, the history major. Yeah, I was, I, um, I've always loved history and a lot because of my family's background. Yep. My great-grandparents all fought in World War I. My grandparents all fought in Europe in the French army against the German army. And I have uncles who fought in, in Indochina, like Dien Bien Phu, doing the War of Independence for uh, Vietnam. Let's talk about this work. Let's talk about, about Syria. It's uh, hands down the, the most uh, difficult, dangerous place for aid workers, journalists, civilians to be. What initially drew you there? I've been to Syria before, and historically, for me, that was a crucial place to cover in terms of its background towards the Western world, its connection. It used to be Western territory, and then that changed. So we st you still see, see that in Syria, and the way people look, the mix, ethnic mixing, right. and the architecture and everything in it. And how were you received by the rebels and, most importantly, by the population? It's a good question because that changed throughout the war. Mm -hmm. Early in the war, you had a very moderate rebel mm -hmm. uh, faction mm -hmm. who would never kidnap journalists because they wanted a story to be out, you know. And I think they understood that in the Western world we like rebellions and the underdog is sort of like mm -hmm. romantic. So in that sense, in the beginning, they were very, um, it's very helpful and they were willing to sacrifice their lives to get us right. in there and then protect us, cover the fighting and then bring us back to Turkey. My third time in Syria, you could tell it was different. Uh, after three years of war, the amount of casualties suffered and the suffering mm -hmm. from the people and the rebel side, people were much more, um, I would say mean, but just didn't trust Westerners as much because they knew ultimately we're not going to help them anyway after. Because yeah. we made so many promises. Right. The, our governments right. did that uh, it made our work more difficult because they were like, you know, wait a minute, where is, uh, where is all the help? It's like, there's nothing I can do about that. You know, I'm just here to cover your story, but yeah. that's yeah. it. So. Your last year you were taken hostage in, in Syria and uh, really you know, scared the hell out of your uh, friends and family and mm -hmm. a lot of other people. And uh, you spent over, what, 80 days? 81 days. 81 yeah. days. Um, just tell us about, you know, how that happened. What, what went up to it? How you got through it? It was April last year, April 29th, uh, 2013. It was my third trip inside Syria, and I, I crossed over a week before from Lebanon. It was quite difficult. Uh, you could tell the government was already planning to take the area back, which is very strategic, because it you know, borders with Lebanon, mm -hmm. and you know they need to have that buffer zone controlled. And we're being shelled more and more, so I ended up telling my fixer to introduce me to another guy who ended up selling me out. When, when did you know you, you, were, you were being held captive? Was it, was it immediately explained to you? Was it? No, I mean, it was pretty clear. I mean, they dragged yeah. me out of the car, put me on my knees, and then they were like shooting gun, like bullets, just right my, you know, they pretend to execute you. Mm -hmm. And then they, they took my t-shirt, put it over my head, then put handcuffs behind you. Or, uh, and you put handcuffs on your hands and then you drive you very fast somewhere else mm -hmm. and then you, that's how it started. So I knew very quickly I was in serious trouble. Mm -hmm. I was very scared, but I was mm -hmm. trying, I mean, they could tell probably, right. you know, but I was trying to be as, uh, 
as friendly as possible. You know, I try to learn Arabic, I mm -hmm. would pray with them, mm -hmm. I would get involved in different things with them. So right. try so to try to develop a relationship. Yeah, just be like, I'm like you, I'm gonna be like you, and they're trying to make things better for me. And that was incredibly helpful. Because after five weeks, the, I wasn't blindfolded anymore, and they removed my handcuffs, and they moved me to a better house. Mm -hmm. And then things got, you know, better. The headquarters, it was like a five-story building. It had been abandoned for most of it. And across there, had a small street, and across the street, you had some, some sort of villa. I mean, it was a wealthy area before right. the war. And that villa had an empty pool, you know, so it was just yeah. in front of our house. And over time, I, you know, I was telling things about myself to the, right. to make myself more human, ultimately, to the, some of these rebels. Like, oh, you know, I swam competitively. You know, I'm a water polo player now, and, you know, I'm just very comfortable mm -hmm. in water. Mm -hmm. So after a while, they filled up the pool with freezing water. They had these tractors and fill up with water anyway. And one day their grandma's like, oh, just come across the street. It's something you have to do for us. So the, the, these, these are your captors? Yeah. And so, they, so, I, so I follow them and they're like, oh, just get in the pool. You know? So I'm like in my underwear and I start doing laps, I remember. And for a brief moment, I thought I was on vacation. It was very weird. And after half an hour, I stopped. I was tired. And I see the rebel leader, the big man, yeah. which seen multiple times, right. who was the reason why I was captive. Uh, he was a very short guy, very chubby, and like this crazy beard, you know, shaved here, blue eyes, very interesting uh, looking man, with an Hawaiian swim trunk. And he's there, and you know, obviously he doesn't know how to swim, so he's trying yeah. to be, yeah. you know, tough, so he's like walking around like this, and, and they're all making fun of him, because he looks kind of ridiculous. He gets in the pool and he can't swim, and basically holding him like a baby, like he's telling him, can't put your arms like this, and I kick straight, and after an hour he could actually swim a really? little bit. But um, it was, uh, you know, like we were saying, these moments in war, sometimes you have these small moments where it stakes out yeah. and, and it makes you feel, um, for a brief moment, free, you know. But then yeah. they're like, okay, go back to the other house and they take you back. Can you tell me, what led to your, your release after, after 81 days? When did you finally know that, that this was it, you were, you were free? Uh, I was just in the house one day and one of the, the officers of the second house that I was staying at, he was very nice to me always mm -hmm. actually. He felt bad, some of these guys were like, this is ridiculous, yeah. it's not good for us, but it wasn't right. up to them. Uh, so like, oh, you're going home, you're going home. I was like, I've heard that so many times, it doesn't matter. So they grabbed me and they put me in a car and I was driven to a, a Yabrut, the first city right. where I was operating. And then there was an exchange of money mm -hmm. And uh, when the officers of the rebel unit left, suddenly two men appeared, they were Shabiha, so they all in black, you know, mm -hmm. weapons. And they were like, oh, you're free now. Mentally, I remember preparing myself to end up in a government jail. Right. And that was very hard for me. Mm -hmm. And so they drove me and then I ended up in Damascus. Mm -hmm. And 24 hours later, I was smuggled back to Lebanon in the trunk of a car. And once in Beirut, they put the guy who paid my ransom and saved my life, ultimately. The Syrian man who is in the parliament. Mm -hmm. um, so he's a pro-Assad guy. Right. And once uh, in Beirut, they put, I was with two of his men in one of these apartments. And they're like, you can't go, you have to wait until tonight. Some other people are going to come check you out. And I was like, okay, but I, I ended up finding a ground line and I found, I got in touch with the embassy. The French, and they called French me, embassy. The French embassy, yeah. they called me back. I was like, I need to escape. So can you send, you know, and you, Did you have kind of an idea where you, where you were in Beirut? I noticed the name of the building, and so it's right. a pretty famous building apparently. So like, uh -huh. oh, we know exactly where you are. And they said next to the bu your building, there's a Four Seasons Hotel. So I, uh, I made a run for it. I just escaped. I left. You, I, tell, what, what do you mean you made, you made a run for it? They went outside to smoke cigarettes to so okay. get something. I took the elevator and left. Went outside and I asked the Four Seasons, like, oh, it's this way. So I walked like 30 seconds. And suddenly two French guys came up to me and they're like, hey, Jonathan, come with us. They grabbed me, put me in the car, and they drove me to the embassy. And then they flew me back to Paris. Take us through some of these pictures. Um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm struck by all of these pictures and they're really, it's amazing. Like for instance, there's a picture with the shaft of light on, on coming through a window, very strong. Almost has a religious uh, overtones. That was taking the second trip. So that was mm -hmm. in the Idlib area. Mm -hmm. and we're deeper in Syrian territory. And we were just doing a story on this small group of rebels who had just been pushed out of Idlib. They were just survivors and they were defending a, a ridge. And we spent quite some time with them and they were all killed the day we, I mean, all, the people in this picture. Yeah, because basically we were attacked multiple times. One of them, uh, they were coming from all sides, uh, mm -hmm. government infantry and tanks. 
and they pushed them back. And then when we left, uh, then that night they were shelled and they were killed. And the area collapsed. So we decided to basically flee back to Turkey. And hence that picture with that truck in the evening. And we basically followed about 100 refugees. And we just literally just ran mm -hmm. like for hours and then pressed on a truck, went through. We were very lucky. I don't know how we made it right. through that. So we had a great story because it was one of the first time uh, we had pictures of refugees leaving in, from inside Syria, not so much after the border or what happens. So we were lucky in that sense. Right. And, uh, lots of kids, old people, just, just making a run for it. At the end of the day, what do, you, what do you want this body of work from Syria to, to achieve? Is it to inform? Is it to bring uh, more attention to Syria? Is it to, to help resolve the, the fighting? Or is it just a kind of cold historical document? My historical background has defined everything about the mm -hmm. person that I am, and especially my career. And you know, some photographers go because they want to tell the world and it's, these bad things are happening and people need to know. I don't operate like that. For me, uh, I will embed myself in a specific historical moment and take it and bring it back. Let's say 100 years from now, you, know, you look back at pictures, the way we look back at pictures from the Civil War or Crimea. Mm -hmm. World War One, World War Two, and they become historical. For me, that's the main, the main reason why I do it. Well said. Well said. Well, hey, thank you for your time. This yeah, has been really great. Mm -hmm.